So today I made a few slides at the beginning to answer a little bit of question that you had yesterday. So how do you address the question of why a volcano is where, where it is? So one can have several questions. One can, ask, can have questions about um, yeah, the distribution of volcanoes in general. So why are this group of volcanoes there where they are? Why are these isolated volcanoes there where, he, where it is? And also, on a different scale, why on these volcanoes the vents are there where they are? Because this is also true that if you, are, if you have a volcano, not always, we were talking about this, not always you have uh, eruptions at the summit, but you may also have eruptions in many locations. And uh, actually, the question is similar. It's just at a different scale. In the case of why a volcano is where it is, I told you yesterday there are actually two components to it. One is why do you have melt in the first place, and where is this melt? And the second is how does the melt from that place reach the location of the volcano? Because very rarely you have vertical pathways. At the volcano level is similar. Um, you can ask, where is the storage of the melt? Where, where is it? Actually, you can even ask, why is it there? You can also ask what shape uh, this um, storage zone has, because the shape will influence. Since when you pressurize um, a magma chamber, we will also talk about magma chambers, but pressurizing a magma chamber means that you strain all the rock around, depending on the shape. Also, you break it in different places. You, it's relatively intuitive to understand that if you have like a very flat melt source, like a lens, it will break at the tips, and then uh, it's, a, I mean, it may also break in the middle, but the tips are definitely the region where most strain will be accumulated. Yeah, if you have something more like this, then actually you are more likely to break it at the top. Also maybe at the side, but you need to, anyway, uh, even if you're not sure about the answer, the shape is going to be critical in determining where the breakage will occur. And where the breakage will occur is also important to determining where it will go, definitely. So, in general, is the questions uh, are where it is, um, what shape, so how it is, what composition it is, because this determines the velocity and determines many other things. Um, and also what is going to be the pathway to the surface. For Atna, um, the question is intriguing because it's kind of interplayed. Uh, and so people actually have debated a lot why Etna is where. I, I wrote she is because in Italian Etna, in Sicily, it's like a female, it's a lady. <laughs> Different from other volcanoes. So the, the source of melt or the melting reason uh, has been debated as far back as in 1973. This uh, Barbary guy is now a very, very senior professor. I mean, he's uh, retired since a long time. He was uh, in Rome and in Pisa, and he's uh, one of the big names of uh, Italian volcanology, Barbary. He also was a lot also in Ethiopia. There are a lot of papers, very early papers on Afa and Tale and all the range there by Bar Barbary. Um, so he was uh, studying rifting, and he said rifting in his opinion, opinion is the reason why Etna is there, because the, the Ionian Sea, that is the sea at the side, was opening, and this is like a rifting volcano, due to the opening of the Ionian Sea. We will see it in the map later. Then other people much later said, no, it must be a plume. And then other people later said, no, it cannot be a plume. It must be that you have uh, a, a um, lithospheric tear, so like you have the malt escarpment, uh, we will show it later. It's a very big scar, and if you create such a big fold, 
you will open an austenospheric window. What is an austenospheric window? It's like if you tear apart the lithosphere too much, you will have in the end, uh, at the very bottom, a place where you basically make the austenosphere open, open to a pathway to the surface. Um, this is, uh, it has been proposed. And then maybe the, the most, uh, freak, the most um, um, recent is like toroidal flow <laughs> around the edge of the subducting slab. And we, I'll, I'll discuss bet, better these options later. But basically there is the subduction below Calabria. So here is Sicily, here is Calabria, and then the rest of Italy, and there is a subduction here. And here not. We will see in the map why. When you have a subduction, you are, uh, um, so models show that you have some flows around the edge of the subduction. And you have this flow, and they, it's called toroidal because it has this shape like a toroid. And if you have these flows, you may melt the rock by the compression because it needs to move around these flows. So this is a, another option, I mean, a lot of options. Basically, everything possible has been suggested. And as a pathway to the surface, most people say um, the mountain escarpment is going to be so like a pre-existing fault, and the other faults that are uh, on the Etna flank are the pathway to the surface. So here in this photo we see a little bit this mountain escarpment, so the tectonic, the bathymetry and topography. It's a bit exaggerated. So this is Etna. This is Calabria, here is the Messina Strait, here are the other volcanoes, the Aeolian Islands, like Stromboli, here is Stromboli, this is uh, Panarea, this is Lipari, and Salina, and these are the other islands. This is Marta, this is Pantelleria, another volcano, and this is the Malta Escarpment. Um, it's a very, very big scarp, it's like uh, more than three kilometers here, and uh, around two here, or over two, uh, the whole way here. Um, it's actually a very big danger in general, so uh, there are, uh, in the historical records, there are tsunamis that have occurred because of a slip on this fault. And um, so by itself, it's a, it's a hazard. And the question why Etna is there, so uh, now I'll show you also a map with the tectonic uh, problems. It's also connected actually at why this area here was affected also by volcanism, but much, much far back. Let's see here the whole region. It's a very old map, but I think uh, new maps are not as good as this very old map. So. Here, this is the trench of the subduction in Calabria. If you look at the seismicity, um, actually I can open it later if you like, you see that all the earthquakes are in this area. You know, the subduction is very flat, and then it dips like this, and you have uh, these earthquakes, deep earthquakes in this region. They go from relatively shallow down to, I think, 300 kilometers, really in this uh, subduction shape that you sometimes have. So here it goes this way. Actually, you know that subductions do roll back for some reason that I didn't entirely understand. I don't think it's very difficult. It's just that it's not my, I never really spent a lot of time to look at it. I think it's easy, but I can't remember why. Subductions tend to, uh, roll back over time. So they, it takes millions of years, but this subduction actually, before it was far north. When it came back, when it rolled back, it uh, rolled back to the Tyrrhenian Sea, like this, and then it hit this part here and this part here. So here, it's actually a piece of continent. Um, this is a piece of the African plate, and uh, it is a thick, thick um, 
kind of continental peace. Um, and the subduction couldn't um, subduct it. And therefore, it created this called the Magrebian arc. Basically, you created a, a mountain, mountain range and compression. And here there are a lot of faults, compressional faults. Also, they, they create large earthquakes. Um, on the east of Etna here, the subduction didn't find any problem and continued to roll back. So, and it basically, I think it hit this area like one or two million years ago, something like that. This volcanism here is much older. It's called, <coughs> um, we will see it in the map. But anyway, Etna is basically um, in a very uh, special location. It is on the foot wall of the Malta Escarpment. All the volcanism is uh, like uh, really associated to the mud escarpment because it's really like on the foot of everything. So the mud escarpment does play a role. Um, most scientists say it is the path to, to, the, to the surface for the magma. I don't think this hypothesis is very good because if, if it was really the escarpment, why is the volcano here and not here? Why is this volcanism here and not here? So why it's not at the fault? Um, then it is really at the intersection between uh, this rollback hitting a piece of continent on the left and a piece of ocean, oceanic crust actually, on the right. Because this here, it's really like oceanic crust. Uh, not very big, but uh, it's very deep and very thin. It's really like considered oceanic crust. Um, so, compositionally, Etna is basaltic. It is not, uh, it's very similar to ocean island volcanoes. Ocean islands are those uh, hotspot volcanoes like Hawaii and so on. But not entirely, entirely, entirely. It has a little bit of uh, um, something that is more uh, evolved. So people say that it must be also this interaction with the subduction that has changed a little bit. Yeah, coming. Um, so just a very, very brief summary, otherwise she doesn't get it. <laughs> so this is a map of Sicily, and we are now discussing the reasons why Etna is uh, here in this location. And very, very shortly, um, this location is special because it is right on top of the foot wall of this very big fault. It's called the Mount Escarpment that looks like this. And also because it is at the location where the subduction that was rolling back millions of years ago hit this piece. Here it's a continental crust that couldn't subduct, the subduction couldn't take it with, the, um, with it and subduct it, so it created a mountain chain, while here the subduction continued and is now right here. Basically the slab broke, everything is now like, even people say it's dying, the subduction, it's not uh, going to continue. So oh. it is the African plant that subducted? Yeah. yeah okay. So also a, a little bit far east, you have it under, underneath Greece, right? Okay, In the Hellenian Arc, and you have also the Santorini and other volcanoes. And on the west, also in Calabria, and uh, then um, yeah, and then the, there is a collision of continent where Sicily is. Okay. So this is the map of the volcanoes. And you can see uh, that there is uh, a lot of volcanism even here in this corner. And then here, and this area here, and Mount Etna. This is called Hyblean volcanism, this name there. And the, the, it's um, very old. So here is uh, like the geological epochs are written um, 
I, if I remember well, this part here is 10 million years old, and the pink part is much older, like 200 million of years ago, really old. At the time, subduction was way far away. It, was, it had nothing to do with the subduction. There was a rifting at the time, and um, um, there were also cycles of uh, um, the like decomposition of this uh, um, Iberian volcanism is even more similar to ocean island basalt. This is o OIB. So basically, this is really like a very, very primitive composition like ocean island basalt. Etna is a bit different, but it is continuous. So if you look at the composition, it goes smoothly uh, going, going north. And even if you go north to the other volcanoes at the north of Sicily, they are also smoothly connected to Etna. So it's actually, the explanation may be even more complicated, the, the overall explanation. Um, so basically there has been a migration at the uh, 200 million years ago, volcanism was occurring here and here more close to the, to the coast. And then later it went to this location, and then later it migrated north. And even if you look at Etna by itself, even at Etna, the edifice, uh, the volcanism has migrated. The very early volcanism was here. It started like uh, 500,000 500, years ago. Etna is 500,000 years old. And uh, at the beginning, it was just fissures opening. A submarine or uh, just at the coast. And you can see them, you can go to the coast and see these uh, lava pillow lavas. Pillow lavas is when lava comes out from the sea bottom and you, it forms these very round structures. And then it constructed several uh, edifices, they are called uh, with different names like rocket, Abderia, etc. etc. And only later uh, now, now the summit is here. So over time, also within the edifice, it migrated from the southeast to the northwest. Okay, now uh, I'll show you um, how these models of trajectories can be used to check hypotheses that actually the magma comes from below the mat escarpment. It may be this asthenospheric window. It may be a different reason. It may be that uh, the creation of the oceanic crust there, the subsidence and the, the, the rifting. So basically it doesn't tell you what the, the, the real reason for the melt is. But it can tell you where the magma is coming from. Okay, and then geochemists can discuss the reasons why it's actually, why melt is there. So basically, if you look at this figure here, so the edifice is, is not, uh, the edifice is uh, uh, not plotted because it's not considered in this. What is considered here, this is the mild escarpment, and this is just the scarp. Like in the paper that I showed you where the volcanoes, uh, the, the magma goes towards the upper part of the scarp. And also in this case, you can see that all the trajectories are, are um, curved, and so actually it's very likely that if you have some eruption in this location, or if you have, so if, if the eruptions are all here, now actually the magma must come from actually below if there was no edifice. Uh, I need to explain it better. Okay, so basically the presence of the scarp makes all the trajectories curved. So in the early time when you didn't have an edifice, in order to have um, eruptions in, that, in those locations close to the coast, you needed to source the magma from below the from below the escarpment, laterally, diagonally down. Once you build an edifice, and here is not checked, 
then you can continue to actually have the magma there because the magma will be attracted to the edifice anyway. So you don't need to have it vertically below. Um, but the most uh, curious thing is, is this one. Actually, you cannot explain. Ah, now the stress is extensional in this area. Let's have a look here because I didn't pay enough attention to this area here. So here you see that the fissures are, some of them are aligned in this way, and some of them are actually aligned this other way. This means that the stress has flipped uh, over time, because otherwise the dike would be aligned uh, in the same way all the time. So um, if you go to this model here now, to the bottom and to the top, this model here show that you cannot justify the fissures that are very far away here, very far away from the mountain escarpment. You cannot justify them if extensional stress is uh, very high, so or if you have extensional stress, because you cannot justify the orientation, because they would be oriented. Since uh, extensional stress goes this way, all the fissures would be uh, north-south. Yeah. So actually, you need, in order to justify both the orientation and also the location, you need to put compression and stress, or you need to flip the stress by 90 degrees. And then if you do, you can see that the same magma that can be sourced here, it goes up like this, and then rotates, because here the stresses change, rotates and creates a, a fissure in the other way. Uh, yeah. Do you have question first? And then I'll try to... So the point is, maybe this diagram also helps, I don't know. The point is that you can have... Everything is controlled by the ratio between surface loads you know, if you have like a scarp, if you have a basin coming in, if you have a caldera created, if you have a rift, like surface load, the distribution of gravitational loads at the surface, and tectonic stress. These two compete. Sometimes they help each other, sometimes they compete. Uh, extension wants dikes to be vertical and coming straight from the bottom to the top. Compression you don't have almost any volcanism because everything will be like this. And it's very hard to escape if compression is very uh, strong and very wide, you know, very laterally extended. extended. Exactly. If you, however, have um, some distribution of loads so that is not even, then you can have some locations where for example, you have a decompression that is stronger than the extension. And then you can actually si locally simulate, if you have, co locally it works if it, as if it was compressing because you flip the stresses. And therefore here you have this. However, outside of this area, then they go like this. The opposite you will have with a big volcano. So you have a big load. Yeah, I can put the... Blackboard only. So you can have, so if you have, let's say, compression, uh, and if you have uh, just uh, a flat area, then all magma will go this way. And there is actually not much possibility for the magma to come out. If you have extension, then all the dikes, they just want to be straight and they are. And you have volcanoes. They actually are going to be separated if you have a flat surface because the trajectories are not going to bother very much about joining or so. Uh, this is called monogenetic. because it is uh, every eruption one cone, a new eruption another cone. 
is actually a mysterious type of volcanism that is occurring in some parts of the earth and it is very important to, to clarify. Um, for example, uh, I know locations in Mexico, of, in Mexico, I know a location in Auckland in, the, in New Zealand. So like the city, the town Auckland is built on a monogenetic field. These eruptions are generally rare. They are generally very infrequent. So you have a field which can be 100 kilometers wide with a lot of tiny volcanoes. And uh, the worry is that the volcano can be just created, you know, overnight and uh, in a populated area. So this is the danger of monogenetic fields. I think one possible explanation could be that you have extension and you have actually some source of matter that you have to clarify geochemically or tectonically and there is no, no topography or even a very slight depression because somehow you need to, to promote the melt or of course you can have a plume too. Okay, so this if you have just simple compression and extension. If you have uh, a if you have, like we saw for the caldera and we saw also for the rift, if you have this in combination with extension, you have actually the pathways are like this here and then they go like this here. The opposite is if you have a big volcano and compression. This can happen, for example, I think in, uh, so, uh, the, in the arch where you have subduction zones because there you have a strong compression and you have also mountain building and then you have this thing. So it's the opposite as here. Here you will have actually vertical magma storage and then you have here and here, um, so vertical pathways and here an area, so at the bottom, while here is like more like this, here, you flip everything and basically you can have a deep reservoir and a shallow reservoir and in between it's easy for the magma to go up and down. It's actually the, the opposite. So this is just by looking at very, very simple uh, configurations. It's just to keep in mind. And then of course when you have a look at a real volcanic area, it's much more complicated. Okay. This figure here shows that the ratio between these things, like the ratio between tectonic extension and, uh, and the pressure of loads or unloading, you know, this ratio is actually what controls the curvature of these trajectories and therefore how far they go. Also, if it goes from extension to compression, they also go flipped, you know. So like here, in this, in this figure, you see that if the ratio uh, is, uh, so if tectonic stress is very low, then you are here, okay. If uh, pressure unloading, pressure loading. Um, Okay, here, if you have, basically, the more, I don't understand my own figure. <laughs> basically, I know what it needs, it needs to show, but I'm confused by the numbers right now. Anyway, the, the, it, it wants to show that if you have very strong tectonic stress, um, you can, A very strong unloading or loading, you can change uh, the, the fate of what tectonic stress tells you. I mean, the two, the two are going to control everything. If you have uh, um, a strong unloading, then you can actually bring all the fractures quite far away, and also you can flip them, it's these crosses up there. It means that they actually go this way. But you need some compression, otherwise they will go uh, if you if you have extension, they will go vertical and vertical, and actually vary at the top of of the. But it's the ratio between the two. 
Okay. So this is just a summary to show that actually it is uh, the hypothesis that was brought forward by some papers that uh, the magma may be sourced between, below the malt escarpment to justify why they are so continuous. Even in the locations in between, you can drill and you find the same magma. And uh, actually somewhere I also have magnetic and gravity maps and you can find that the magma is everywhere, not only where you see the eruption. So basically the entire section in, in this area is full of magma intrusions below. So they are totally continuous and therefore you need to find a common, common cause. I think this completely excludes subduction as the cause because otherwise you cannot explain the Iblean volcanism. You know, so you can actually Sometimes people focus, so this is uh, another thing, sometimes people focus on the very new volcanoes because this is what you know best. They are not so much, uh, um, you can still with geophysics uh, seeing the feeding system, you can see a lot of things. However, sometimes I think it is very crucial to consider also older volcanism, especially if it is linked. If it, is, if it has uh, the same composition, if it is, because, because you need to not only explain one thing, you need to explain the overall context. Otherwise, your explanation um, is not that useful. Yeah. Okay, anyway. I want you now to have a brief overview. On, on Daikin models because like 20 years ago it was a big debate on how it is best to actually model dikes. This is a good figure in this paper, Rubin 1995, it's our first review of dikes, where it shows like the two basically families of approaches. The approach to the left is an approach where you have uh, when people consider only the viscous flow, you take a straight dike and you solve the equation of the flow of magma within these two walls. And another approach where actually fracturing is considered the, the most important phenomenon. I skipped one slide, actually maybe it's better that I talk about it that by itself, it's a very challenging topic. And why it's so challenging to study a dike that looks actually not, not so difficult? Because you have a lot of uh, physical processes to take into account, actually. The most difficult probably is the first one, because you have a fluid dynamics of a compressible fluid flowing between moving walls. So like, uh, if you have uh, two rigid walls and you have some fluid dynamics, this is solved. And also compressible fluids generally are very difficult for fluid dynamics because it's difficult to um, solve mass conservation and solve all these uh, coupled with the other equations. And in this case you have the fluid is compressible because you have bubbles so that makes it very compressible actually sometimes. And the walls are moving all the time. So it's actually a hard problem by itself. Then you have heat transfer and you can have convection, advection, diffusion, everything, and phase transitions continuously while everything is propagating. So you have bubbles forming, crystals forming. This is going to change the viscosity. It's going to change the local density. It's a kind of a mess already, solving for the fluid dynamics. Then you have fracturing at the propagating edge. And this adds a layer of complication because uh, fracturing by itself is a difficult uh, topic. And then you have very high stress concentrations and the possibility that uh, your rheology may not be elastic at all at the tip of the propagating dike. So you can have plasticity, you can have a difficult rheology to solve. And this is just a few. Probably if we think enough about that, we can put more uh, more difficulties into the problem. This uh, uh, basically has led to the development in the early studies to two completely different approaches. In the approach to the left, people have neglected fracturing and it is just uh, fluid flow. 
and in the approach to the right, people have neglected the fluid flow, and it is only about fracturing. And basically, you don't have anything in the cavity. It's considered like a cavity or like a pressurized. You, you consider the pressure, but you don't consider the viscosity of the fluid that is flowing in between. Um, these uh, have been developed in parallel, and they have been criticizing each other a lot, like the approach uh, of the left has said that the approach to the right was completely wrong because um, fracturing anyway is not as important as uh, viscous flow because you, you, um, if you measure the fracture toughness, this is the fracture energy, let's say, in the laboratory for uh, samples this big, you get a number, this number is uh, like uh, one megapascal per square meter, it's like a strange unit, that if you compare this number to the energy that you have to um, provide to the flow to actually counterbalance the dissipation and viscosity, it's much smaller. So it cannot be important, it is like uh, a minor thing. So therefore, it is completely useless to have an approach where you have only fracturing and no flow, they were saying. But these people on the other side, they were saying, no, this is not true, because it's true that in the laboratory you get this number, but if you go to the field, and if you look at the very large dikes and the tip, how they are, uh, the shape of the tip and the size of the dikes, etc., then, uh, the fracture toughness, fracture energy cannot be that that you measure in the laboratory. It needs to be two, three orders of magnitude bigger. And then it becomes viscous flow that is irrelevant because this is so big that it's going to dominate. <laughs> so what the, the debate? Until some people try to actually, I'll show you what you get. Ah, by the way, if you get this approach, you get uh, basically a fracture that looks like this. You have uh, like a, they call it a nose region that is a bit more inflated here. And here is uh, straight, two straight walls. The reason is that the actual kind of propagating dike is the nose region that propagates. But you cannot, um, elasticity even if pressure is high, cannot squeeze the viscous fluid out of the uh, fracture very efficiently because it's viscous. So the, the fact that you have a viscous fluid makes the wall stay parallel while you have the flow. Um, in the other approach, you get a very thin tail. Basically, it's completely closed because there is no viscosity in the, in the crack. And the shape is more like, you see, like a, an inverse teardrop, while here you have this shape. I can tell you already that, uh, well, let's go through the things. So first, uh, let's have a look at this one. So basically, this one is just uh, is to, to solve for the shape of the fracture, you have to put basically that the stress intensity factor at the tip is equal to the fracture toughness, while the stress intensity factor at the bottom is equal to zero. What does this mean? The stress intensity factor is basically um, the, a factor that controls uh, the stress intensity at the tip and it's uh, related to the elasticity to fracture mechanics. If uh, basically you are assuming by doing this that the fracture has exactly the shape that makes the fracture energy equal to the fracture energy of the rock at that point, while at the back it's closing, and therefore the intensity of stress needs to be zero. If you do this, you obtain this shape. Um, so basically this is the, you take the formula for the stress intensity at the tip, and it is this formula. Basically, it is like a, a gradient, like P0 is the pressure at the center of the crack, like here. A is the half, uh, 
length of the fracture and the P over the Z is the, the pressure gradient inside the fracture. Generally it's like delta rho and G, so like the difference in density between inside and outside and G. This is the, going to be the pressure gradient. And this is the formula, so if you take a crack that has a linear gradient, this is the formula that describes the stress intensity at the tip. And if you put it equal to Kc, and you put um, like uh, in the opposite end here, you put equal to zero, then you get, uh, if you solve for the length of the fracture, basically you get that you need to have a critical length for the fracture. What does this mean? That if it is smaller, you don't have this configuration where you have uh, stress intensity factor at the tip uh, uh, Kc and zero. You cannot have it. You only have it if the fracture reaches a given length and then which is equal to Kc over square root of pi delta rho g to the two thirds. Then you can have this shape and the crack will start to actually break the rock at the tip and close itself, pinching closed, entirely closed at the bottom and propagate like this, equal to itself until it reaches the surface. So it's of course a simplified solution, but it is a very cool solution. Um, and the opening, the equation for the opening of the crack is going to be this one. Um, it is basically uh, this constant, where these are the elastic parameters, g is the shear modulus and mm, is the Poisson's uh, number. And here they see, and then here you have clearly like an ellipse multiplied by a straight line, right? Like a, this is what gives the shape like this. Um, okay, this model today is basically symbolic. It's not really very useful. It just, uh, you cannot really use it so much, but it is, uh, it was uh, an important model because it demonstrated that uh, you can have, in principle, a constant mass ascent if you, if you accept that you lose zero mass at the bottom, that the, vis the, the fluid is basically has very low viscosity, and uh, it, you can actually go all the way to the surface. And people already at the time were arguing if the viscosity of your magma is really, really low, and uh, then you are actually going to effectively close the tail quite well. And if you have uh, decompression because you are bringing anyway some magma from the bottom to the top, you can have a volume increase just by decompression, especially if you have some gas, then actually it's actually feasible. You don't even have to, it may be realistic. For example, I think it is relatively realistic for these kimberlite magmas that travel so long because they have very low viscosity, 0 0.1 pascal per second, and they need to, they travel too long, I think too long distances to admit that you have a channel connecting them for 100 kilometers, you know, from the bottom to the top. They need to travel on their own. Anyway, let's go to the other one. The other one uh, has also lots of merits. Um, here there is no fracturing at the tip and you get this kind of shape here. Um, you, um, the equations look like this. Actually, the, it, it's not very difficult to obtain them. It's called the lubrication theory. It's a simplification of the um, Navier-Stokes equation. If you put just one dimensional flow, and if you put um, uh, no turbulence, everything is uh, laminar. Then you get this kind of equation where H is the opening of the, actually here there is a, I think I put an equation written for, for a different figure and the figure written for a different equation because actually this W here is what is H here. So the opening of the fissure. Um, and again here you see that you have the buoyancy, so like everything is works by buoyancy, 
Here, not yet, but actually it's important also that you have a flow from below, because if, if you cannot keep up the flow from below, these, these uh, fractures are going to stop at some point, because they lose too much mass in the tail, so you need to have flow, a connection with a magma chamber that still feeds, feeds the fracture. And then, but in this way, you can really solve for the exact shape of the fracture and the velocity of the flow in them. And this is kind of, you know, uh, turned uh, 90 degrees. This is going to be the tail, this is going to be the head. They are all like normalized. Pressure is going to be, you will have this pressure gradient here. Actually, this is the pressure gradient that the other fracture has. You can see, but uh, it's actually zero here. And then here you have a uh, different. So actually, they are not that dissimilar. It's just that the other model models the head and a very thin tail. Um, some people from the two directions, actually this down here is uh, my current boss. <laughs> and the other, guy is, uh, the other guys are from Cambridge. From both directions, they try to include the other effect. So like uh, the, in this work here, he did include in a Wertmann fracture, so in one of those fractures, a very simplified equation for a flow. And then he got that actually you do develop a, a tail, but it, it was like not easy to, to, um, to solve this tail. Um, yeah, anyway, the shape was becoming like quite similar to the other shape if you included the viscous flow. The other uh, approach also tried, so they took their solutions, which are these, and they added fracturing at the tip. They found a way to add it, and then they decreased the viscosity, and you see that if you don't have a big viscosity and you have fracturing, then the shape gets very, very similar to this other shape. Actually, so all discovered that they were talking about the same thing. No wonder that. And uh, then more modern models include everything. They have fracture toughness. They have this Poisson equation for the flow. Mass conservation you can put in order not to lose too much mass, for example, if you want. Um, and then you need the elastic deformation at the, at the rock. And um, these people have worked uh, at this uh, kind of problem. Um, and there are nice papers showing these composite models. Um, these people, by the way, are also my collaborators. I work with them a lot. And with uh, one of them, we wrote a paper where we uh, made a review of all these dyes, and we also assessed if you wanted really to use just one of the two approaches, in what conditions you can use it. So what sort of parameters or situations are good for just the extreme approach. And we figured out some um, um, adimensional relationships by saying, okay, you need to lose very little mass in the tail if you want to use the Bergman approach uh, and the other one yes and you need to have uh, uh, viscous so in order to use basically the viscous, uh, viscous dominated approach you need to have fracturing less important than the viscous flow this is clear and to use the other approach it needs to be the other way around but also you need to lose a little mass in the tail otherwise it doesn't work so Basically, we arrived at these two equations. Uh, this equation says when viscous flow is much more important than fracturing, then you can have a look here at the equation, and you can see that everything boils down. Since the elasticity of the rock you cannot change, this is going to be it. Uh, it boils down to viscosity and the, the flow. So if, they are, uh, if viscosity is high, and you have an inflow from the magma source high from below, then you are likely to be in this regime where you can only consider viscosity. If, uh, on the other hand, viscosity is very low and you have uh, not much influx, then maybe you can consider the other one. But again, you also need to consider that you don't lose so much mass. 
and basically uh, again low viscosity and low influx is going to be what uh, what helps you and actually one can go and really put the numbers into it and what um, one figures if, if one does this is that until dikes are short actually the viscous approach is better because you when they are very close to the magma chamber you are still you have still a lot of influx even if viscosity is not very high it's probably a better model when if you have dikes with very low viscosity and here i mean really basaltic dikes like in iceland or etna this kind of uh, magmas where your viscosity is around 10 and 100 at maximum maybe a thousand and they are very very long um, then also the other approach is going to have good results. So basically, otherwise you need, if you are in the middle, you need to have a mix. And then there is this new combined approach by Virginie Pinel. Uh, she worked at combining them in this way. So first, one calculates the trajectory of the crack by using, because actually these trajectories calculations I didn't say, but you now can see that the trajectory calculations didn't have any viscosity, didn't have any mass flow, any flow of magma within them. It was just an elastic thing to see what was the elastic energy release uh, doing and therefore what direction the craft would take. So she decided to do this approach by which you first calculate the trajectory and then on that trajectory you calculate all your stresses and everything, normal stress to the dike and shear stress that the dike might have, everything that uh, comes along. And then she runs on that trajectory the viscous flow model. In this way it's a simplified approach because actually the two approaches are uh, based on different assumptions and they don't always really are combined very well so it's actually just a first attempt. But in this way, you can get a velocity for the different trajectories. So what she did, she worked with Francesco Macaferri. He calculated all the trajectories. Here is like a case, I think, of unloading, where you have all the trajectories avoiding the load. Um, with different ratios between the overpressure of the so the unloading is always the same, I think, but what changes is the ratio between, or actually I, I'm not sure what he changed, but what was changing is the ratio between the buoyancy of the dike and the unloading. Because this, I told you yesterday, if you have a dike that is not very buoyant, it will follow the stress very carefully. If it is buoyant, if it is, bu if it is buoyant, it will go its way. So basically here you see that the magma pressure over the pressure of uh, the unloading is very large, so the dike will go vertical. Here the magma pressure over the pressure of the load is 0 0.5, it will suffer a little bit. And this one here is uh, like the purely, the trajectory that is purely along the, the stress. And then she was running her models along these trajectories and basically, what she found is that uh, here on the, on the, right, the x-axis, you always have dimensionless time, which is time times uh, this entire equation here. And on the, on the y-axis, you have dimensionless elevation, so how far to the surface the dikes arrive, dimensionless dike length, and dimensionless propagation velocity. So basically, propagation velocity doesn't even change so much along the various trajectories, a little bit. But what changes is that in some cases, the dike never reaches the surface. So you have, you see, magma trapped the dust. So the elevation, basically the dike stops at some point. Um, yes. So in the end you can get, so it's like an attempt to, to go towards forecasting where the dike will go and how long it will take to, to actually have an eruption. Okay, so 
Now, in this half an hour, I will show you some gelatin experiments. Don't know if they work from here. Otherwise, I need to open them. Okay, I'll show you first this one. So, how are these experiments done? You take, uh, uh, actually before I uh, show in this movie, I'll show you another one on the web that I found yesterday. Because it gives a lot of explanations. Make the audio towards you, otherwise it's hard to listen. That's what we're going to do right now. You've got to have a gelatin mold, and this is just plain uh, Knox gelatin. And all it is is their packets, they're these little packets, and it's the, the packet. Packets are one packet per cup is the per cup of hot water that's the consistency you want and so uh, all i did was just mix up a lot a big pot of boiling water one cup of liquid per packet and it gets to be about this consistency so it's pretty hard regular jello doesn't work as well so it's kind of a kind of a more thick consistency this is going to be flipped upside down this is going to be the mountain and then inside is going to be the magma that's being injected into the system and the mag magma being injected into the system it's just plain old chocolate syrup. And I've kind of trial and error and figured out that chocolate syrup has about the right uh, consistency to actually keep its shape and form in the gelatin mold. I've tried a bunch of other stuff, they don't work as well. And then you have a plate. Uh, it can be a tin plate, such as this, or it can be a plastic plate with holes poked through the bottom. And, um, and then you have a syringe, the larger size the better to hold more magma, so this is going to act as the magma chamber. And the magma chamber will be filled with magma, and then that has to fit into the holes, because the mold is going to be sitting on top of here. And then what you have to do is, you have to support the mold high up so you can get underneath it. You can do it with pieces of wood, as I have or you can do it with pieces of cardboard tubing. Uh, the size kind of the size of the syringe or the injector, which could be a plastic bag for all that amount, could will determine the size of your supports. So I found that the higher it works a little better because you can really get up into it. And so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take some hot water and we're the, the mold has to come out in one piece. And so I've just taken boiling water, put the mold into the water, and that will melt just the outer layer of the mold so that it will come out of the mold in one piece and you won't have any breakages along the external surface of the mountain because that way it doesn't work as well with the jello or with the chocolate sauce being squirted into it. And so you just kind of set it in there, uh, depending on the temperature of your water, it might take a couple seconds. This water has cooled down a little bit, so it might take a little bit longer. But you just kind of feel it, and, and uh, if you get enough of it melted, you'll actually be able to kind of twist it inside the mold. And once it's at that point, that's, uh, that's, a, that's, that's what you want. So when you tip it up, upside down, it comes out in one nice piece. Inside. So you can kind of see it's, it's, it's kind of... It's a lot more jiggly in there. So let's see if we can get this to flip over now. And voila, there's our mold. Very possible. <laughs> so it's supported up here and you've got the holes underneath and now all I have to do is inject the chocolate. This is insert it into one of the holes and press it up in there. And then when everyone is fully anticipating 
a grand show. You simply press on the plunger and this is what you get. But what you, what you see there is a nice vertical column of magma forming with a couple little offshoots at the bottom. So we have a series of volcanic dikes, a dike complex as you would call it. And then if I continue to push, uh, magma will continue to rise up in there. And if it gets to the side, it will eventually push through and you have an eruption. Where the, extrusive be, where the intrusive becomes extrusive. And so in this case, that would be a volcanic eruption extrusively, but all of the magma that remained inside would therefore would then harden over time and become the intrusive landform. Okay, so there is another one. This is very short. That's good. You are enough. Yeah, just oh, yeah, that's, that's good. You got the big You got the big go. Yeah. Ready? Yeah. Okay, I'm good. That is an excellent. It's going to breach. This is the, the very good for kids. Uh, if you want to show kids how really volcanoes are, it's a good good system. And then you can even use edible stuff, and you can eat it <laughs> like the chocolate. Or you can also inject Coca Cola, and then you will see the bubbles and uh, some more lava fountains. And then there are versions of this experiment that are a bit more, you know, uh, controlled. So in this experiment, there was like a cylinder filled with gelatin, and then again at the bottom there were holes, and the fluid that is injected is actually air. So it was an empty syringe that was uh, pushing air into the gelatin. And if you do this, you obtain really something like this. So let's have a look first. So first of all, maybe you can see that actually the tail really closes very effectively. So if you have air, air viscosity is really, really low and the gelatin elasticity is able to actually squeeze the vast majority of the air out of the tail. If you, with your finger, touch, it's going to be a cut. So it's really like completely smoothly cut like with a knife in the tail of the fracture. So it's not, I mean, some people ask whether the gelatin is fluid, it's not fluid. It's, if you turn it upside down, you have like really this wobbly thing, okay? Still, you see it like in the form of a bubble. It looks like a bubble if you, it looks like a very, very thin and squeezed bubble. If you use gelatin that is uh, more towards viscous, so, uh, rheological parameters, you can actually uh, measure them and they have different gelatin types and there are some that have some rigidity but some viscosity, it's like something in the middle. Then you start to see that these cracks, they get thicker and thicker and thicker and if you look at them from above, they look like thin, 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 but also they look like an ellipse, 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 ellipse until you get, uh, uh, yeah, like a a bubble. So basically this shape you really get when you have a brittle, stiff, rigid thing injected with a fluid. Okay. This is the form of transport. You also can see in this case it started tilted, it continued tilted and you also can see some lines here. If you have a look at the rest of the video, this is centimeters by the way. Um, you can see that there are these lines and they are always perpendicular to the propagation front. You can see some of them will appear. Yeah, and when it reaches the surface, all the air go goes and you don't see anything, but if you look at the gelatin, there is a cut. 
Um, I will show you other effects. Um, okay, this one. This one has a layer, so like uh, in the middle there is a discontinu like a discontinuity of material. Um, here there is a discontinuity of material. Here is stiffer and here is less stiff. In this case the crack is standing really vertical and uh, it's uh, very thin and very long and then you can see here what happens when it reaches an, a different uh, medium it becomes thicker. faster, thicker yeah and actually, if you really analyze the frames uh, with, uh, in detail, you can see that the fracture accelerates a little bit before uh, it sees the new medium. It starts to accelerate already. And before the free surface, again, it accelerates. And then there is this one. This one that actually uh, left it for too long in the refrigerator and it went a bit uh, mold and so it developed all these uh, bubbles in the lower layer. You can see the bubbles, but it's still very interesting. And also here, the discontinuity is very extreme. So you have at the top a medium which is much, much more compliant. So you can see what happens. So first of all, these uh, irregularities, like uh, little bubbles, they cause propagation not to be entirely homogeneous. You can see that it goes um, and then it goes really fast because the upper medium is very different. And then I can show you. This. So in this case it's the opposite, I think, I think. So the crack, ah, by the way, look at the oscillation that you see in the tail. Anyway, squeezing the air out is not easy, and so you have this uh, instability. And the air is squeezed out at intervals. Um, here it stops. Why does it stop? Because we saw that you need a critical length to propagate a fracture that depends on the fracture toughness. Here the top gelatin is more rigid. More rigid means also more fracture toughness. So basically this crack probably had enough length and mass to actually propagate in the bottom layer, but it didn't have enough to actually propagate in the upper layer. So it can just stop like this. And you see also that when it stops, it changes shape. You see? And then what I did was to inject uh, some more air from here. You see the syringe ne needle. And then if more air is added, then the fracture can actually penetrate into the upper layer and then uh, with more air one can have a dike also in the upper layer. Yeah. 
and then here I think it's the same just the dark becomes really really large or I can't remember this one actually So it's very stiff at the top, right? But eventually it manages to cut through and then it's like a monster dam is created. And then I have this one here. And what it does in this case, it's actually instead of penetrating and going up, it forms something like this. Yeah, and you can form like a seal in this way. And I also have some new movies. So Rami, you can see some new movies. <laughs> because some students came to do a project and they did some nice movies okay let's see this one so first i have a look at this no actually wanted to show something else have a look at this first okay this is um a gelatin with a, like a valley okay um the fringes are obtained by birefringence by refringence I don't even know how to say it it is a process by which you put a polarizer sheet behind and a polarizer sheet at the front the light from behind comes in it becomes polarized and then depending on whether the gelatin is stressed or not you have a different refraction index so the velocity of propagation of the, of the light is different if the gelatin is stressed. Therefore, it accumulates a delay, that ray. And then, uh, um, in the end, basically it appears as uh, these fringes. So these fringes show that uh, there is a delay in the phase of, of the light. And then, basically, it's a stress. It shows that the gelatin is stressed or strained and this uh, delay is proportional to the difference between the two principal stresses. So basically here you really show that there is a, a decompression or a compression, you know, like in this case a decompression. And then now I will show you the movie of what happens if you inject uh, something in here. So all this motion is because the gelatin is actually not super strong, it's actually relatively weak. You see the crack? You see the stress that the crack yes, sits? Yes. This is, I think, water, actually, or air, I can't remember. Probably it's air, or it's water, I can't remember. Anyway, you, say, you see that the trajectory curves, and you can also see that actually there are, before it was not really visible, but you can see now that there are two other trajectories that uh, were previously injected, here and here. Like if I go back, I didn't know, um, let's go back. They are visible, you can see like there are two other pathways. And then this one goes all the way like this. Well, I'll accelerate it because you, you got the point that they run slow. And then 
it goes this way. One, one thing that I want you to notice is that the gelatin is faster when it is vertical, no, the fracture is faster when it is vertical, and then it slows down here in this position, and then it, it uh, accelerates again, just before erupting. Another thing that you can notice is that along the path you have now a stress discontinuity, so probably the path has displaced a bit, so the fracture when it passed uh, moved uh, the, the two sides of the path a little bit um, off each other. And in, the, in this other peak, they colored the whole path by injecting colored water. I think it was air, but here they injected the colored water and you can see uh, five paths that show this unloading effect. And there is another one by then. Let me see. Oh, here in this way. I think. Well, let's have a look at it. Here it's only loading, it's just a thin plate, you see that there is a plate at the top that is loading and here, let's put it down, the crack is going just towards the load and then it's erupting below the load and then in number five Here they put uh, both a valley and a load and here there is already one pathway that goes like this and they add another pathway that goes like this and here I can show you the final one because the final one is this I think the final one shows also in this case that you can have uh, so basically, four of those, you had both unloading and loading, so it was pretty obvious that it will all go uh, this way. But also another one that went, that was right below, it went basically like this. And then it decided to actually turn below the unloading like this, and then it erupted at the edge of the container towards me. So this, I think this is a cool method because it, it uh, can show a lot of the... Um, so it was very illuminating for me when I first saw these experiments and you, by working with dikes, okay, you can say like in the field, but you can also see how they move and if you do different effects, what they are going to do, that they are really controlled by stress, that they really create their own, their own path, it's really visible here. So of course, if these dikes meet a pre-existing path, of course, if they went to touch uh, one of the pre-existing paths of the previous cracks, of course they would go there, but it's not necessary for them. They can actually go their own way and propagate very far away. Uh, do you have any questions in general? Curiosities? Actually, while I was talking to you, I um, remember that there is a very recent paper by a student who decided to do this experiment. I will ask him, I will write him an email if he can send me a movie. Or maybe it's even online, maybe. I don't know, I have to check. He decided to take, they have a big lab, it's in Singapore. In Singapore, where the, the, there is a university called EOS, like Earth Observatory. Singapore um, and they also have a gelatin lab and they have like a big room which is refrigerated so they don't need to take them so here we have like a refrigerator and we take the gelatin out of the refrigerator and uh, they can have also a big tank so he has like a meter by a meter tank like this and then from below he was injecting gelatin for uh, a week 
and then this gelatin was like erupting as a fissure and creating like a lava flow then again more uh, gelatin erupting and creating a lava flow until basically uh, you form like an edifice and then you were seeing all these dikes forming in the gelatin uh, at different times so during the time that I have between this and, and later I will try to, to see if I can find this, this paper because it's uh, actually very very nice um, yes uh, other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, we say that the, the volcanoes in Upper Triangle are from extensional, uh, mm -hmm. from extensional unloading of the crust. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've seen some suggestions that there might be a plume that originates just <coughs> below around South Africa and migrates. And to the triangle. So, yeah. So, um, the, the model of unloading only tells you, it doesn't tell you why the magma is there. It tells you only if it is there, where it's going to go, like in this case, you know. Yeah. If it is pulling, because actually all the plume models, this is true in general, plume models can only tell you, because the, the the physics uh, that they solve uh, in plume models is uh, transport by porous flow. It can only, only work until the top of the mantle. After that, they actually don't know. Because these models only tell you that there is some melt that is going to propagate there by this, but then the lithology, the, the rheology of the upper part is not included in plume models. You have the brittle lithosphere is not included. Uh, some part of it is included. The problem with including it is that it's a completely different time scale and spatial scale. Like plumes are solved over millions of years, so you know the models. These things occur over a few days, right? And they don't have this temporal resolution for this. Also, they don't have the spatial resolution because these things are a meter thick, and they have uh, their uh, pixels are uh, maybe. If you are lucky, they are uh, like uh, 500 meters. So actually, this form of transport by diking is not included in the plumes. And definitely, you have diking in the upper 40 kilometers, let's say, or 30 kilometers. You definitely have this. And it cannot work by the way that plume models work. So um, plume models can tell you. Uh, what happens below that depth. But then above this, I think these models are better because they just solve for what uh, is there. Yeah, so uh, now maybe you can tell me again better. So this blue model told so, that. Uh, what is the source of melting just below our part? Is it from the plume? Uh, this, this is debated. Okay. I think most people believe that there is a plume, yes below afar. This, uh, these models don't deny plume nor yeah, they, they approve just plumes. Explain. They just uh, say, just uh, yeah, the just, just say, okay, once you have pulled the magma in the lower crust, it will go this way or that way. While to really, so I mean, you can use the models in principle to explore the debate of the plume or not plume, because you can say, Okay, my model to explain volcanism here and there, I need to have a magma source there. May I see, do I see it with the magnetotellurics or do I see something else? Okay, in the end, basically you have, um, they can help you together with other methods, identifying where the source of melt is, and then you can check whether plume models are consistent or not with that particular location and that particular shape um, also, I think, you know, to prove or disprove a plume, I think it's, uh, you need to really look in time scales of millions of years, and they are not the time scales that these models can tackle, they will tell you only, yeah. Okay. First, uh, yeah. the dikes is just one form of magma transport, so 
Yeah. What is the other way? Like a long lift conduit and magma chamber just sitting below it. And so, yes. yeah, which is the most popular way to transport the magma to the surface? So the main, in terms of yeah. most volume of magma is transported to the surface, because in terms I of... Found there is yeah. a lot of uh, volcano that we have a magma chamber and just a long lift conduit. There, there are a lot so of volcanoes that are like that, yes. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, they are mainly subduction zones, volcanoes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for example, one is those volcanoes that build a dome. Yeah. They have a conduit through which you have the flow. And then... Uh, um, so, can you make like a, an example? A real example. No, I don't know. Yeah. I'm volcanoes. Because there are a lot of volcanoes. Yeah. So we will also go one day to look at the conduit flow models mm -hmm. and how they work. Um, also, if you have like a very active eruption, let's say. Uh, in the end, you tend to develop a conduit also out of a dike because the dike is only the way you actually open this conduit, you know. Mm -hmm. So you have basically magma sitting somewhere in the crust and then a dike will help creating a path. Once the path is created, if you still have pressure and you still have a lot of magma, then this magma will go through, yeah. erode the walls and create something that looks more like a conduit. Maybe it it, it, it will still be a fissure, it depends. Mm -hmm. But then you develop a different form of transport, you know, mm -hmm. that is actually a bit thicker, maybe not as long, and, and it becomes um, more concrete-like. Like, for example, Stromboli, you know, Stromboli, we saw Stromboli volcano. Um, it, is a, it has a continuous supply of these gas slugs that explode and create the eruption. So there the dike was, uh, I don't know when it was first created that one, but it's certainly not new. So, however, sometimes there are new dikes in Stromboli. Mm -hmm. Like the, the conduit is too pressurized and then it breaks the, the volcano and you, you see a fissure and you see a new dike, right? And then this dike maybe dies out it uh, becomes uh, firm and uh, magma continues to go through the old one. And the old one, they say, is a dike-like, meaning that the old, old conduit, so the conduit through which you have the Strombolian eruption, is uh, something like uh, a few hundred meters long and only a few meters thick. So actually it's something that is between a cylindrical conduit and a proper dike with a very long aspect ratio. So sometimes you develop this kind of conduits and then the magma goes up and down, even convect through this. Or even in Artale, we, we saw that probably originally it might have been a proper dike and then with the convection and the flow, then you develop something else. And this again is something occurring over a longer time scale. Dome forming volcano, then it becomes critical for the magma to so basically, it does form something more cylindrical because you have a so viscous, such a viscosity. And actually, this viscosity is not a f something that affects the magma very deep. Actually, when it's very deep, it's still very low viscosity. Maybe not very low viscosity, but low enough that you actually have dikes. Indeed, um, like Montserrat, which is a dome-forming volcano in, in uh, it's a UK volcano in the Caribbean, um, they, they think that below two kilometers depth, you actually have a stable, dike-like kind of shape connected to the bottom. The bottom is like a magma chamber, and then you have this dike-like thing that, because the magma from the bottom to the top, its viscosity varies very quickly, like before it's relatively, I don't know, I don't know how much, I cannot tell you a number, but maybe, 10,000, I don't know, Pascal per second, something like that, a million, 100,000. And then when it gets too viscous, 
you ca uh, they can uh, they think this really more flat thing becomes more cylinder like and then you have like a cylinder like conduit going up but this is just one kilometer or, or one and a half mm -hmm. and below you have something more thin and even below you have dikes ascending and feeding the magma chamber so even in volcanoes that actually are dome farming if you go deep enough you always also find dikes and just the upper part where the magma is uh, 10 to the 10 pascal per second there you have this very cylinder-like kind of eruptive conduit yeah so this is how I see it but uh, it is also true that I'm a bit biased because I always go to volcanoes that really work in this way like uh, I go to to Iceland to I, I work a lot on like volcanoes in Japan that are, that are uh, also basaltic in Africa, in rifting volcanoes, basaltic, Hawaii, um, Piton de la Fournaise, Etna. But even other volcanoes like uh, Campi Flegrei, for example, also Campi Flegrei has dikes from the magma chamber to the surface. And also, viscosity is not very high there. Um, also, um, but there are, yes, along the chain in the Andes and uh, in the Caribbean and uh, some volcanoes in, uh, in the West United States, they form domes and they yes. are more this other type. And also probably uh, now I, I'm less informed, less well informed, but I think also volcanoes around the Pacific on the uh, like on the Indonesian side, like Merapi is also a dome farming volcano. Um, and then there are some that are hybrid, like you can have both dikes and sometimes you have a dike and a lateral eruption. Like for example Mount Agung in Indonesia, there was a lot of talking about this Mount Agung last, last autumn because it was uh, having a lot of earthquakes and people were fearing that it would create a big eruption and it was in Bali, you know, where a lot of rich people go for vacation. So they were all worried, they were calling me, I booked a vacation in Bali, should I go? And I was saying, yes, please go. <laughs> wow, why are you telling me that? Well, if you don't go to the volcano. No, it was like this. And they, they, in the end it was a dike, the seismicity was a dike and it didn't even go to the top of the volcano. But that is uh, actually a very explosive volcano. But, the, you know... So dikes go further away from the, the volcano? They may go, you know, they may go here you have the volcano, they may go like this, mm -hmm. and then you have a dike eruption far away, or they may feed slowly, slowly, you know, the feeding system mm -hmm. that really goes up and then they can pressurize. You know what? We have had a um, lot of dike eruptions, many, many, and we can see in the field a lot of eruptions that, do, that have uh, paraclastic flows and domes and so on. But we don't have a lot of deformation data yet. Very, very good. Uh, well, I don't know. <sighs> okay, I will, in uh, next week, I will bring uh, a few more evidence for magma transport. So I will try to fatten up the, the class on the conduit flow to show more more stuff okay to this afternoon we will we will see some cool um dike seismicity and then next week we will do well the week after we will do something else okay